Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Fighting Game Retrospectives, and I'm gonna let you in on a little secret about me. Well, considering what this channel has looked like all month long, it's not that much of a secret, but here goes anyways. I love Halloween. It has always been my favorite holiday. I love the creepy, I love the spooky, I love the kooky, I love the altogether ooky, and most importantly, I love monsters. And if you love fighting games and you love monsters, then odds are you've played or at least watched people play Darkstalkers. Yes, back in the 90s, Capcom was the king of fighting games, and Darkstalkers was actually their second biggest in-house fighting game franchise. And when your number one is Street Fighter, the series that literally created fighting game culture, yeah, second place ain't too bad. This series exploded onto the fighting game scene, becoming a massive hit that cultivated a diehard fan base. Unless you were in the fighting game community or an arcade rat back in the 90s, you will never truly know the fervor that Darkstalkers fans had for this series. How even within a niche video game community, it managed to carve out an even nichier community. So today, I'm going to delve into the backstory of this series, cover the characters and the mechanics, all to try and remind people of why this series was so special. And then, of course, cover why exactly, despite having a strong fan base, we haven't gotten a new installment in over two decades. Oh god, I'm already getting sad. Let's jump right in, shall we? In 1991, Street Fighter II took the world by storm. It was one of the biggest and most widespread arcade games in history, becoming so big that I honestly don't think I even need to go into any details about it because how on earth do you not know about Street Fighter II? But this isn't the story of Street Fighter II, this is the story of what it gave birth to, which was the rise of fighting game domination. Everyone on the planet wanted to jump onto the fighting game bandwagon and try and gobble up as many cores as they could. Capcom spent the next several years re-releasing Street Fighter 2 over and over and over again, but eventually, they couldn't ignore it any longer. They had to look out at the sea of other fighting games rising up to compete with them, and they realized, huh, you know, maybe we shouldn't be putting all of our eggs into this one basket. In fact, according to Alex Jimenez, a producer for Capcom USA who will become way more important to this story in a second, he got a call from the heads of Capcom in Japan and they said to him that they had an engine designed specifically for two characters to fight each other, and they asked him if they should do anything with it. And he was genuinely stunned that they even had to ask that. Which is understandable. At a time when the fighting game genre was taking over the world, the guys who made the biggest fighting game of all time didn't know if anyone wanted them to make another. It's almost refreshing to know that Capcom and their weird decisions with their fighting games has always been a part of the company since the beginning. Now, we're about what? Three, four minutes into this video? What better time for this story to become overly complicated? You see, there are two conflicting stories about who it was that came up with the idea for Capcom to create a fighting game based around monsters. According to art director Akira Yasuda, Capcom artist Katsuya Akitomo had the idea for a monster fighting game, and Junichi Ono mapped the whole thing out. However, according to Capcom's American producer, Alex Jimenez, yeah, remember him from a moment ago, Capcom came to him with the idea of a new fighting game, and Jimenez, being a big monster fan, suggested basing it on classic Universal monsters. Jimenez was also the guy responsible for working out deals with Capcom involving any American properties, such as with their Punisher video game or the Alien vs. Predator game, so he went to Universal Studios, Universal rejected the idea, Jimenez said, screw it, we'll do it ourselves, and he went into a room and emerged an hour later with his own roster of spooky OCs. Now, as much as I love that last story because I like the idea of a Capcom executive being thrown out of Universal Studios and being told, what are you gonna do, make your own monsters? I'd like to see you try. Oh yeah, welcome, have a lucky day. Mm-hmm. 
Well, he certainly showed me. I've tried looking into this and it is impossible to tell who is actually telling the truth here. So after looking over all the facts and listening to everybody's stories, if I had to take a guess, I'd say that both stories are probably true to some extent. Remember, this was back in the early 90s when you couldn't just hop on a Zoom meeting and hammer everything out with everyone there at the same time. This whole thing was one big game of telephone. Literally. With a language barrier being thrown on top of it, and the earliest interviews I can find still came out over a decade after the game was made, so everyone's memories probably got jumbled up along the way as well. So, Akitomo, who was a big fan of American comics and movies, even later being the employee who would encourage Capcom to cross over with Marvel, probably did have an idea to make monster games since they were popular at the time, and Capcom then probably reached out to Jimenez to check and see if that idea would sell well in the West, and he jumped out and encouraged them to pair up with Universal, and after being rejected, he came up with his own roster of characters as proof of concept to Capcom that they didn't need Universal, at which point in time, the game's planner Junichi Ono probably took those ideas and did some work on them. But again, that's just my guess. There were a lot of probablys in there. However, what we do know for sure is that after Jimenez turned in his hypothetical roster, Capcom artists and producers started the long process of bringing those characters to life, and these initial characters underwent several revisions. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I love looking up early concept art for characters and seeing how much they changed over time, and the Darkstalkers roster did not disappoint. From the big cuddly Sasquatch starting off as an imprisoned Cyclops, to Victor being a full-blown robot, to the big alien boss Pyron starting off life in a very fancy suit that feels almost like a JoJo's villain, these characters changed so much that you could have made a completely different fighting game with these scrap designs, and you would never even know that they were all linked to Darkstalkers. I mean, just look at Dimitri here. He has some designs that feel like classic movie monsters, like they were left over from the initial pitch to Universal, and then other designs that look like they were going for the most anime aesthetic of all time, and the developers looked at and said, not anime enough. Two of the most interesting examples of how much these characters changed came from two of the series' most famous faces, Morgan and Felicia. As you can see here, Morgan's design was originally very different, ranging from something that looked like it came straight out of Castlevania to a giant intimidating wall of muscles. And part of the reason why she started life so differently is because originally she was going to be another vampire. But Jimenez said that because they already had a vampire, that was kind of boring. So he suggested that they change her to being a succubus. At which point the Capcom Japan team asked, what's a succubus? And he replied, and I quote, it's a female demon that kills men by screwing them to death. At which point, according to Jimenez, the room exploded into cheers of, oh yeah, do that, that's cool. Which probably explains why even though we haven't gotten a new Darkstalkers game in 20 years, Capcom is still pumping out Morgan merchandise like their fighting game division runs on it. Which, considering the budget of their last couple fighting games, it very well might. And as for Felicia, originally Jimenez pitched that she would be a tall Maasai woman from Kenya with short hair who fought primarily with her legs, and she would transform into a panther with each of her special moves. But then he got the designs back from Japan, and they had turned her into a bubbly showgirl from America who was always in a half-cat form. However, Jimenez's pitch didn't die there, as Capcom would bring it back for Street Fighter 3, where they turned it into Elena. Yeah, Felicia and Elena both started off life as the same character. And when you look at their personalities, even that lines up. They're both really upbeat and positive, and they both love to dance. It blows my mind to think that somewhere out there in an alternate reality, Elena is on the cover of Darkstalkers standing side by side with Morgan and the whole Night Warriors crew. Now, while we're talking about the character designs, this would be a good time to bring up what exactly made Darkstalkers different from not just Street Fighter, but from so many other fighting games flooding the market at this time. It wasn't just that the cast was made up of monsters, but it was how these monsters were created. You see, Darkstalkers is a series full of bizarre creatures that all fit into one single world, but if you stop and zoom in on this picture, if you just look at these characters individually, they can feel like they come from completely different games. And there's a reason for that. Unlike a lot of other fighting games at the time, where all the characters were mapped out by one artist or a team working together, the characters in Darkstalkers were divided up among the artists at Capcom, with each creator being responsible for designing everything about the character they were given. That's how we ended up with a game that had a Vegas dancing cat girl, a haunted armor that eats souls, and a kung fu werewolf all in the same game. 
and the artist who created the individual characters were also tasked with making stages for those fighters, which explains why the stages range from Spooky Haunted Castle to Turn the Century London Street to Crichton Shining Modern Day Las Vegas to the Japanese stage, which gave us the original Hype Dog. Yeah, sorry Blaze Blue, Darkstalkers beat you to it. But we're not done just yet, because another layer was added on top of this roster, because while the team at Japan were in charge of designing these characters, Jimenez and his team overseas were in charge of actually figuring out who these characters were. So they were the ones who crafted the story of the game, including the names for the characters, their backgrounds, and how they were related to each other. Yeah, just imagine that. You had a team of multiple artists, all creating characters completely separate from each other, then you had a totally different team of people on the other side of the planet coming up with the backstory for those characters. This sounds like a recipe for a jumbled mess. How did all of this work? Well, that was thanks to one Haruo Murata, who was brought onto the game fairly late into its development, and up until this point, Murata had mostly just been responsible for UI elements in games, things like on-screen icons and text. But for this game, he was given a fairly simple task. Figure out how to make all this fit together. Yeah, he was brought into a game that already had all the characters, all the story, and all the mechanics worked out and was told, okay, you tell us how this works. So, Murata added the one thing this game was missing. Personality. He made sure that the animation team added in little details to each character, whether it be how they entered the ring, how they walked, how they reacted to being hit, or their expressions as they attacked, and this made each character feel full of life and highly exaggerated, but exaggerated in a universal way across the entire roster, which made them all fit together. And to achieve this unique brand of personality, Murata had the animators take inspiration from some rather unexpected sources. You see, when a lot of people think back to Darkstalkers, they probably remember that there was this dark, intimidating tone with all these big, horrific monsters in there, or they probably remember the more mature tones and all the blood effects splattering everywhere, or the sex appeal that made the game so much more adult in nature compared to many other fighting games at the time. But that's not what I remember about Darkstalkers. Oh no, that's not what I loved about this series. No, the thing that always made this series stand out the most to me is that Darkstalkers was goofy. And before anyone gets upset with me saying that, I am saying that out of love. This series was silly, it was wacky, it was zany, and I love that about it so much. You see, after Capcom upgraded its hardware to the CPS2 model, they were able to create far more detailed sprites and could put more of them into every single animation. And while they had used this system on some of the later installments of Street Fighter 2, they were still working off of the previous framework of those games. This was going to be their first original fighting game made with this hardware, so they wanted to make sure that Darkstalkers showed off what exactly they could do. So ironically enough, for a fighting game loaded with dead guys, they wanted to make sure this animation was full of life. So when it came to the actual animation and how these characters would move, their animators took inspiration from, and I am not kidding you on this, Tom and Jerry and Hanna-Barbera cartoons. And when it came to the color pattern of the game, they took inspiration from Disney. Yeah, I'm sure that when many of you think about who helped to inspire the world and tone of Darkstalkers, your mind is immediately going to Dracula and Frankenstein, when actually it should be going to Mickey Mouse and Fred Flintstone. And if you hear all that and you think, no way, that sounds crazy, take a look at these animations. Everything from how each character has a unique appearance after they get set on fire that makes them look like a cartoon character who just tried to smoke a stick of dynamite, to the bouncy squash and stretch in each character's walk cycle, or how they fall down, to the idle and taunt animations that are just loaded with personality, to some of their unique attacks. I mean, heck, Victor literally attacks you with a big booty bump. Every ounce of this game is dripping with golden era animation charm, and that was the glue that held this game together. That's what made all of these different characters feel like they actually could exist in the same world with each other, and you could not have Darkstalkers without it. And beyond just creating a unified theme for these characters, it also allowed the game to show off what exactly was possible for fighting games. This is maybe the most important impact of Darkstalkers, because you see, 
Most fighting games at this time were based around martial artists. And sure, characters could shoot fireballs out of their hands, but everything was still roughly based on actual human bodies and actions. But here, you had zombie men shooting out bones, fish men turning their arms into tentacles, a succubus launching a rocket out of her back to fly across the stage. Because these characters were monsters, the animators were really only limited by their imagination, which ushered in a brand new era for fighting games. It let game developers know that you could now go as big and crazy as you want with them. Listen, I'm just trying to say that if it was not for Darkstalkers, we would not have Crab Fight. That is just a fact. But now that the game itself had a unified look and feel to it, they needed the artwork of the characters to do the same. Remember, each of these characters had been designed by different people, so now they needed someone to bring all that together. So Capcom took a relatively unknown artist at the time and promoted them to being the face of the franchise. All the artwork that you would see for this game would come from them. And that artist would come to use the pen name Bingus, and if you are a fan of Capcom, you know Bingus. He would go on to be a major artist for the company and help to shape this era of video games. So, now they had the characters, they had the art style, they had the mechanics, everything was in place, and Capcom was ready to unleash their newest creation onto the world. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! Darkstalkers was released in arcades in Japan on June 30th, 1994, and July 5th in the rest of the world. Now, something I should go ahead and address right here and now, while the game was known as Darkstalkers The Night Warriors in the West, in Japan it was called Vampire The Night Warriors. The English team wanted a name that would reflect this entire world of creatures that they were dreaming up, while the Japanese team thought Vampire would stick with players more. And this seemed to work out for everyone, because no way would something as generic as Vampire have worked in English, but in Japan, the name caught on and was quite memorable. However, this was the start of many, 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 many name variations between the Japanese and Western releases. But before we can talk about that, we have to talk about the characters. The story of Darkstalkers revolves around an evil, unholy realm called the Makai, a home to demons and other supernatural creatures. This realm starts to merge with a human world, and the head of the vampire clan, Dmitri Maximov, holds a tournament to see which Darkstalker is worthy of ruling the Makai. Fun fact, Makai is actually the name of a hellish afterlife in Japanese mythology, and Capcom had previously used this name in its Ghost and Goblin series as the realm where all the monsters of that game came from. Which was probably a total coincidence, but considering how much Capcom likes to use its fighting games to link its series together, who knows, maybe they had something more in mind. Now as for this cast of frightening fighters, there was of course Dimitri himself, who oddly was sort of meant to be the protagonist? Which is one of the earliest examples I can find of an anti-hero protagonist in a fighting game. Dimitri didn't care about humans, he just wanted to rule over the demons and was willing to do whatever he had to do to make that happen. Again, very unique, but considering this was a cast of monsters, it was pretty fitting. Then there was Morgan, a Scottish succubus who would go on to be the face of the franchise. She was from one of the other ruling families of the Makai and would act largely as Dimitri's rival, the two of them constantly trying to kill each other like some kind of a demon anime version of Spy vs. Spy. Then there was Anacharis, a mountain of a mummy who wanted to bring back his ancient kingdom, Bishamon, a Japanese man who had become possessed by a haunted suit of armor and, speaking personally, probably has the creepiest backstory of anyone in this game, Felicia, a cat girl who had been raised by a nun named Rose, but when Rose died, she left for Las Vegas where she found several other cat girls just like herself, and they all started up their own musical. John Talbane, a British werewolf who found a way to control the beast inside of himself through martial arts. Interestingly enough, Talbane is one of the only Darkstalkers to never appear as a playable character in any game outside of this series, despite the fact that he was actually voted as the most popular Darkstalker in America. 
I guess that must not have been reflected in the rest of the world. I don't understand myself, but man, I would love to see this guy reappear someday. After that, there was Lord Raptor, an Australian rock and roll superstar who died but his demonic heavy metal reached the ears of the Demon King Ozum, who then decided to resurrect Lord Raptor as a zombie to be his servant on Earth. Rikuro, a fishman from the Amazon who believed himself to be the last of his kind. Sasquatch, a warrior from a race of Canadian Bigfoot. Or is it Big Feet? Eh, it's not important. His tribe had been at war with humans for generations because they had been hunting on their land until the humans gave them bananas, so now they like the humans. Oh, banana. And lastly, there was Victor, a Frankenstein-inspired robot created by a mad scientist. His creator died shortly after giving Victor life, but Victor didn't understand the concept of death and thought the professor wasn't responding to him because he was ashamed of him. Not because he was, you know, a burned-up skeleton. So, he set out to prove how strong he was in hopes of gaining the professor's respect. Now, those were all the selectable characters, but if you made it all the way through the arcade ladder, you'd find two bosses at the end. Quetzal, a robot who came to Earth 65 million years ago to destroy the dinosaurs, and now he had reawakened with the mission to destroy all life. Then there was Huitzel's creator, the big boss Pyron, an alien from the planet Hellstorm who consumed galaxies in fire, and now he had reached Earth. Now, just like how the name of the game was changed when it came over to the West, the same went for many of the characters. Except that considering that the Western team is the one that came up with all the characters' names, it means they were actually changed for the Japanese release. I bring this up because at this time in video games, that was actually a very rare thing. It was fairly common for video games to have character names or the entire name of the series changed when it came over to America, this is one of the few times in which the exact opposite happened. In Japan, Rikuo, John Talbane, Lord Raptor, and Huizol were renamed to Alboth, Galon, Zabel Zerok, and Phobos. Not for any complicated legal problems or translation disputes, no, the Japanese team just thought those names sounded better. Now, if you're wondering where many of these names came from, they mostly stem from references to mythological figures or even to classic universal monsters that the game was inspired by. Huizol came from Huitrolopakti, I apologize for butchering that name, the Aztec god of war, because even though he had originated beyond the stars, this particular robot fighter was discovered in Latin America. John Talbane was a reference to John Talbot, the father of the Wolfman in the 1941 movie of the same name. Rikuro was named after Rico Browning, the stuntman who did all the underwater scenes in the original Creature from the Black Lagoon. Bijamon was named after Bijamonten, the Japanese god of war. Victor is an obvious reference to Victor Frankenstein. And Morrigan is named after the Irish goddess who foretells of doom and death, and whose name roughly translates to Queen of Monsters. Now, I know that's a lot of information to throw at you all at once which was kind of the beauty of this game and why it instantly hooked so many people. In a world with a hundred fighting games all about martial artists fighting to prove they were the strongest, suddenly having a game with a mummy and a fish man popping up where the plot was you have to stop Satan Galactus, much like how bizarre horror films can carve out a cult audience because of how imaginative they can be, Darkstalkers was doing the same thing in the fighting game community. But it wasn't just because of the characters that the game found its fanbase. Oh no, because even people who didn't care at all about monsters and ghouls and ghosts were falling in love with this series because of its gameplay. I mentioned that Darkstalkers ran on the same engine as Street Fighter, but I wouldn't blame you if you didn't realize that because when it comes to the actual combat, these were very different beasts. Darkstalkers was fast. It even featured the ability to choose between three different speeds, with the highest speed being quicker than anything fine game fans had seen at the time. And the actual combat leaned into this speed as the game introduced chain combos, where you could build a combo just by simply moving from one attack button to another, making this an immensely more satisfying game for casual fans who didn't want to spend hour after hour and quarter after quarter to learn frame data or figure out what moves linked into another. Now you did light, medium, heavy, boom, that's a combo. And in addition to that, the game introduced dashing and more importantly, air blocking. Now, I'll admit right here, I may be wrong about this because shockingly enough, there isn't a complete guide to the history of air blocking online. But near as I can tell, this might be the earliest example of a game including the ability to block in the air. Now all of this, the increased speed, the ability to simply string together combos, the ability to dash and even block in the air so that you could now safely jump in on your opponent without fear of retaliation, 
It made Darkstalkers the most unga bunga game on the market. This was not a game about slowly moving back and forth to watch your opponent and play footsies with them, hoping to get in one hit here or there. No, this was a game about going in. However, there were also defensive mechanics, such as a guard cancel, where you could quickly go from blocking to counterattacking. Yes, folks, this game was so offense heavy that even your defensive maneuver was another attack. And to further encourage offensive behavior, you did have a special meter that built up over the course of the match, and once filled, your special moves would be stronger or you could unleash your character's super move. However, if you stopped attacking, the meter started to drop. Meaning, you couldn't just sit there and take your time and wait for an opening, you had to get in there and find an opening, otherwise your super meter would be gone. And once that meter was filled, it would also start to drain quickly, but now there was no way to stop it. Meaning, the moment you had super, you couldn't just sit there and think, aha, I have this resource now, so I'm just going to wait and take my time until the moment is right to use said resource. No, that's boring. You have super, the game wants you to use that super. And if you don't, it's gone. That's your fault. You should have used it when you had it. In many ways, this was the first quote-unquote anime fighter or air dasher as they would come to be known. A fighting game where speed and big crazy moves were the name of the game, making this a spiritual precursor to games like Guilty Gear or Blaze Blue or Fighters. Hell, Arc Systems probably owes their entire existence to what Darkstalkers created. And the game was a big success. In 1994, it was the fourth highest grossing arcade game in Japan, and in America, Replay Magazine listed the game as the most popular arcade game in October. Very appropriate. And the magazine Video Game, because yes, in the 90s you could just name your magazine Video Game, called it the best arcade game of 1994 and the second best game of the entire year. And when the number one game of the year was freaking Donkey Kong Country, Hey, as I said earlier, no shame in coming in second when you're going up against the best. And Capcom was paying attention to this success because they quickly jumped on making a sequel. Well, eh, kind of a sequel. The very next year, Night Warrior Darkstalker's Revenge, or Vampire Hunter Darkstalker's Revenge in Japan, came to arcades and before I get into any real details, let me just say I love that name because it sounds exactly like a cheesy horror movie sequel. Something something, Blank's Revenge, that's exactly out of the 80s schlocky horror movie playbook and it lets me know the team working on these games knew exactly what they were doing. Now, as I said, this game was sort of a sequel. I'm sure that if you know anything about fighting games, and well, hell, even if you don't, you probably still know this, but in the early 90s, Capcom didn't just put out Street Fighter 2, they put out Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition, Turbo, New Challengers, so many different versions of this one game, each with slight additions. These days, these types of updates would be DLC, but that wasn't really an option back in the day, so anytime they wanted to add new mechanics or new characters, that was a whole new game they had to put out. However, even though Night Warrior's Darkstalker's Revenge was basically just an updated version of the original, Capcom still treated it as a full-blown sequel, while also treating it like a remake of the first game. Okay, strap yourselves in for this. You know how in the first game, the story was Dimitri holds a tournament to find what Darkstalker would be the new ruler of the demon realm, but then at the end of the game, a big fiery alien pops up to try and take over the world? Yeah, Capcom looked at that and they realized, oh yeah, maybe that should have been the story the whole time. So, there was no new boss, Pyron was still the big bad guy, but now the story was actually about Pyron coming to Earth to conquer it and our only hope were the creatures of the night. Outside of that, the story elements were completely the same. In fact, they didn't even make new endings for any of the returning characters. 
However, now Huichol and Pyron weren't playable characters, and Huichol's backstory was changed so that he was still a deadly robot from space, but after being buried in an earthquake, he was reprogrammed by ancient Mayans to be a hero who would protect the people of Central America. Now, there were two actual new additions to the cast. Asinko, or Lele in Japan, who was a young Chinese girl who merged with her twin sister Mei Ling, or Shaolin Lin in Japan, and together they became a Jiangshi, which is a creature from Chinese mythology that is sort of a combination of a vampire and a zombie and a ghost all in one. It's sort of hard to explain. But the most notable thing about Jiangshi is that they move by hopping, which she did do, proving that this game still had a ton of personality in all their animations. And the other new character was Donovan Bain, who was a Dompier, a man who was the child of a human mother and a vampire father, making him a normal human who was constantly struggling against the dark power inside of him fighting to come out. So he had to set out across the world to study martial arts and magic to find ways to combat the forces of evil, giving him a widely varied moveset that included using his mystic sword to fly around the screen or summoning out magical deities for special attacks. Now. Donovan and Hisinko were special from the rest of this cast because despite still being part monsters themselves, they were known as Dark Hunters, people that actually hunted Darkstalkers, which is why the Japanese release was known as Vampire Hunter. However, despite Hisinko probably being the bigger hit with audiences, at least judging by the legacy that character has had, at the time of release, Donovan actually took far more of a central focus. Donovan was kind of the new protagonist, which probably came from the fact that Capcom realized, wait, did we seriously make the big vampire that wanted to kill all humans the protagonist? People are going to cheer that guy on. So they created a brand new character who was part human and who was out to destroy all the bad Darkstalkers, even giving him a tormented backstory and a young sidekick who, ironically, I think became more popular than he was. Yes, I'm talking about his tiny traveling companion who stands in the back of all the stages during his fights, Anita. She was a powerful psychic who was hated and feared by the people of her village, so much so that she shut down her own emotions just to deal with the abuse from everyone else around her. Donovan stepped in to save her and asked her to follow him so he could try to keep her from turning to the dark side. So yeah, Donovan was created to be the new star. But only for this game! Yes, this was another unique thing about the series. Because while Ryu was always meant to be the protagonist of Street Fighter, Liu Kang was always meant to be the protagonist of Mortal Kombat, Darkstalkers had Demetrius the protagonist of Darkstalkers 1, and now for this sequel, they created Donovan specifically to be the protagonist just for this one game. The idea of making a new star for every single game was wild, no one else was doing that at the time. And Capcom was serious about this decision, because Donovan's story mode ends with him giving into his dark side so he can save Anita, which causes Anita to cry, means she's regained her humanity, and then it cuts to years later where Donovan is now a blood-sucking monster with only a hint of his former self left inside. Yeah, can you imagine a fighting game where in the end they just flat out get rid of their protagonists? The only other game I can think of that did anything remotely close to this was Tekken when they got rid of Kazuya when they went to Tekken 3. But even then, they still gave Kazuya two games before that. Capcom was so serious about getting rid of Donovan after one appearance, he didn't even return for the sequel. As far as gameplay changes go, more options were given to the chain combos, creating far more variety and customization to them, and to further lean into the aggressive nature of the game, if you knocked an opponent down, you could perform a pursuit attack where you gave your opponent one more hit on the ground. However, there were a few more defensive mechanics instituted as well, such as the ability to roll away from your opponent after being knocked down to give yourself some breathing room, and as for the speed saints, it went from being three options to just being two, normal and turbo mode. But now, you could also select an auto-block feature, which did limit the amount of chain combos you could perform, but in return, the game would automatically block the first 10 hits you were going to take in that round. And now the super meter didn't start draining when you built it up, and you could raise your super meter up to 9 stocks, which still leaned into the game's offense-heavy, casual-friendly, super-aggressive playstyle. Oh, you want to save your super just for the right moment? Forget that, man! That's boring! You've got nine supers just sitting right there! Spend a little meter! Treat yourself to a cool move! In fact, speaking of said cool moves, even though all the returning characters mostly used the same sprites from the last game, many of them did get new animations, including special wind poses for fulfilling certain requirements, and some extra moves that showed off even more of their personality. My favorite had to be Lord Raptor's Hell Dunk 
which in my opinion is the best looking move in the entire game. He has his little minion sprout out and eat you, then spit you out as a basketball with every character gaining a unique basketball sprite, then Raptor dunks you into his minion's mouth. This move just captures for me how Darkstalkers was always the exact right level of over the top. Now with these new characters and the enhancements to the gameplay, Night Warriors was a big success. Multiple outlets said that the gameplay was a vastly superior version of the original. Because of this, Capcom immediately got to work on a sequel, but they decided to give themselves a little bit more time to work on this one, because starting with this third installment, they were going to take a vastly different approach to how they plotted everything out. Darkstarters 3, called Vampire Savior The Lord of Vampire in Japan, released two years later in 1997, and when Capcom sat down to create this game, they did something different from how most fighting games were being plotted out at the time. They started with the plot. Yeah, these days when it comes to fighting games, you've come to expect a big crazy story mode in there. But back in the 90s, most companies didn't really care about that stuff. They would just come up with how the game would play, came up with a core premise, and then create a couple of characters to fit inside of all that. It was pretty much just SNK at the time trying to craft big stories for their worlds, but fans were responding positively to this. Fighting game fans actually wanted to know about these characters and their big crazy backstories. So for Darkstalkers 3, Capcom realized this and they said, wait, people actually like these characters? Well then let's focus on the characters. Let's actually think about what the new story would be, and let's try and build the game around that. You can see this in many of the new characters as Capcom was no longer trying to think up classic monster archetypes and trying to figure out how they could all work together, but instead, they were looking at the lore they had built up, and they were trying to now actually create characters that would specifically fit inside of this world. The story was going to focus on Jetta Domo, a long-dead member of the noble ruling class of the Makai, being resurrected. Before his death, Jetta thought that Belial Einzelin, Morgan's father, was left in charge of the Makai, then it would fall into chaos. And, after being resurrected, he finds out that guess what? Belial had become the ruler of the Makai, then he died and left his daughter Morgan in charge, and now all the other lords and noble families were fighting each other for power. So Jetta looks at this and says, I TOLD Y'ALL THIS WAS GOING TO HAPPEN! So he does what any sane rational demon lord would do. He decides it's time to destroy all life and start the universe over again with him in control. So, he creates a pocket dimension called the Majigan, and his plan is he's going to use this dimension to suck up the souls of the world until every living creature becomes a part of one entity, the Shintai, or the Fetus of God. However, he needs strong souls to give the Shintai the power it needs to absorb and control all life, so he lures the strongest Darkstalkers alive to the Majigan, where he will kill them and add their souls to this new god. Okay. You see how much more detailed that is than Dimitri starts a tournament, or Pyron is invading the Earth. Seriously, you don't even know how much I'm leaving out of that story summary to get this video down to a manageable size. But you can totally see several elements of this story injected directly into the game itself. For example, the arcade ladder is designed so that now it looks like a big spiraling circle that you're slowly moving around going towards the center. That's the Majigan. With each fight, you're slowly making your way towards the center of this big spiraling black hole pocket dimension so that you can meet Jetta. And Jetta's stage isn't just another dark spooky setting, that's the fetus of God right there! That's the thing he is about to feed you to! Also, it's the thing all of you are going to see in your nightmares tonight, I apologize. Now aside from Donovan, Huichol, and Pyron, all the older characters do return, and in addition to Jetta, there were three more new characters. QB, the leader of a family of soul bees, a race of humanoid insects that had taken over Jetta's family land after he died, BB Hood, or Baby Bonnie Hood, or Boletta in Japan, that is the last of the Japanese-English language disputes, I swear, 
She was the only human in the Darkstalkers roster, and like Hisinko and Donovan, she was a Dark Hunter, except she was a full-blown villain. She might have dressed like a cute, innocent little Red Riding Hood, but she was actually a bloodthirsty mercenary who killed monsters for money, like the mob hitman of the Darkstalkers universe. And the final new character was Lilith, who... Okay, if you thought that whole Majigan, Fetus of God, Jedi Domo story was complicated, get ready for this. When Morgan was adopted by her father, he saw how strong she was and thought that power might be too much for her to control. So he took a third of her power and separated it from her. However, over the years, that power gained a sentience and Jetta gave that power a body and that was Lilith. Still following me? I will not blame you if you're not. In fact, wanna know something funny? As complicated as Lilith's backstory is, it didn't start out that way. Originally, Lilith was going to be Morgan's older sister, who was also part angel. And that was it. Yeah, isn't that way simpler? Wanna know why they didn't go with that? Because according to the developers, they thought there were already too many angels in fighting games. Despite the fact that near as I can tell, there was really only one at the time, and it was an alternate skin for a character in Tekken 2. Yeah, not kidding, that's the actual reason they scrapped this design. Tekken ended up screwing over the development of this brand new Darkstalkers game. And not to spoil the rest of this video, but you might want to remember that I said that. Now, you might have known something about the story description. Jez Big Beef was with who? Morgan's dad. Her dad died and left who in charge? Morgan. Jez Big Right Hand Monster? Morgan's power given life. Who is on the box right there? Morgan. Yes, as I said, each Darkstalkers game had a different protagonist, and for Darkstalkers 3, Morgan was the one who stepped into the center stage, making this one of the only times I can think of where a supporting character from the previous games now got to be the star. I guess after three years of selling Morgan merchandise, Capcom looked at that and said, Huh, I wonder if this means anything. And since then, Morgan has gone on to be the face of the franchise. But those were all the characters in the roster. Sort of. You see, there were also a handful of secret characters who were mostly alternate colors to existing fighters, but as I said, Capcom was focusing more on the story this time around, and they used these new secret characters to help flesh out this world. There was a Boro Bishimon, who was the ghost of the samurai originally cursed by this evil armor, who was now struggling to break free of his control. Then, sort of the exact opposite of that idea was Dark Talbane, essentially the evil werewolf curse that existed inside of John that he was constantly fighting against for control of his own body. And lastly, there was Shadow, a dark ghoulish figure who, when selected, would have you play as a random character. But once you beat another character, you would see Shadow rise up over their defeated body, and in the next match, you would now play as the character you just defeated, with their victory screen just being an eerie silence, implying that this Shadow creature was possessing the body of the character you just defeated. This is a great example of how you can actually use the structure and the animation of the game itself to tell a story. And speaking of how characters use their animations, Darkstalkers was a game that always looked good for its time, but this new installment was going above and beyond. Yes, all the returning characters used the exact same sprites, but the new characters continued to show off the cartoony physics that made this game so special, like the fluid squash and stretch of QB's stinger when she stabbed an opponent, or Jetta using blood to inflate the opponent like a balloon, something that feels more in place in a Warner Brothers cartoon than in a fighting game, and their animations continued to be loaded with so much personality, like how BB Hood cries and smacks you around before dunking you in a pole of her own tears, or to then flash a sinister smirk to show what's lurking behind her childish exterior. Or Lilith putting you in a DDR minigame where you have to dance like your life depends on it. And speaking of supers, once again, the returning characters did mostly use the same sprites from the previous games, but many of them did receive new moves and supers for this installment. Including a move that is so infamous, I am required by law to talk about in this retrospective. The Midnight Bliss. Come yes, this was a new super move given to Dimitri in this game, where he would slide across the stage, present the character with a rose, and then turn all the male characters into female versions of themselves, and all the female characters into... I don't even know how to describe it. Sometimes it was an exaggerated version of themselves, sometimes it was a sexier version of themselves, and sometimes it was just... 
Whatever this was supposed to be. Yeah, it was weird, and it was goofy, but it was also Darkstalkers. This was the kind of thing that when you saw it, you said, yeah, that fits this franchise. This franchise and literally no other franchise is the kind of super move that could only exist in this weird hyper-fast anime monster fighting game. However, beyond this particularly notorious super, so many other small animations were polished to make the older characters look even better. In fact, several of them even now had additional characters pop up in their animations to help flesh out their backstories. For example, Lord Raptor's little minion Lamalta now appeared in his intro animation, and Huitzel now had a small boy named Cecil who was running around in the background whenever he was fighting, and this was the boy that helped to teach Huitzel how to be a hero. They didn't do anything, they were just there for lore, but again, this was the game that realized stuff like that was important. And unlike the last game, Darkstalkers 3 created new stages for everyone, and these are some of the best backgrounds from any fighting game of this generation. From fighting on a demonic living train to standing on the side of a building, and then there's Bishamon's new stage, which is the creepiest stage in fighting game history. I mean, just look at how many small, eerie details are in this location, and what the heck is moving around underneath those sheets? Oh my god, it's horrifying! It's oh, it was just hype, dog. <laughs> And when it came to the gameplay, guess what? It got even faster. Yeah, this game was attempting to cut out as much fat as they could to just get to the lean goodness of the combat. So in Darkstalkers 3, there were no longer rounds. Both players started with two full life bars, and the moment one life bar was depleted, the combat would pause for just a second and then immediately resume. Seriously, look at how little time they give you to get your bearings. I am not speeding this up at all. You get knocked down, then bam, back on your feet. And when you took damage in this game, the initial damage you received would be in white on your life bar. And if you managed to not get hit for a while, then the white life would start to heal. And I love this, because again, this game does not want you to slowly walk back and forth looking for an opening. This is a fighting game they want you to fight. Hey, congrats, you got the life lead right now, but oh, wait, look at that. Your opponent's life is starting to heal back. Well, what are you doing standing around for? Get back in there, punch them, keep their life from going up. Oh, wait, now you've been hit. Now you're the one with the white life. Well, that ain't going to recover if you just stand around blocking all day. No, you need to get in there and put them on the defense. That's the only way you're going to have time to heal. Get yourself back in there. There were also more chain combos, including the ability to do them in the air, and they add another defensive mechanic that allowed you to push your opponent away while you were blocking. And considering this was a game where they did everything in their power to encourage you to keep attacking, it was probably a smart idea to give players the ability to buy themselves some breathing room. And your super meter no longer went up to 9 bars, no, now it went up to 99 bars. Which... Why? Nobody was ever going to get 99 bars. That was impossible. But it was still great because, again, this game wants you to do cool things. So many other fighting games give you that cool moves budget, where if you work and you struggle and you try and save up, then maybe one day you can do a cool thing. Yeah, not Darkstalkers. Darkstalkers writes you a cool moves blank check and tells you that you never have to pay it back. And in addition to all of your super moves, you could now use your meter to activate the Dark Force. While activated, the Dark Force would completely change up your character's playstyle for a limited amount of time. These effects ranged greatly. For example, BB Hood now fired rockets out with every single attack. Felicia summoned in another cat girl to fight beside her. QB gets pincers that extends her reach. There are so many other fighting games that have special modes that characters can enter, but they tend to be pretty lame. You activate this new mode and now you get some glowing hands and you can now cancel this one punch into a different type of punch. That's boring. This was over the top in the best way. When you activate Dark Force, you feel like you just unlocked some hidden power. It feels like your fighting game character just evolved before your eyes like a Pokemon. It was exactly what a super mode was supposed to be. And if you still don't think the Dark Force sounds cool, when you activate it with Lord Raptor, it played the first three notes of Michael Jackson's bad.
What more do I need to say? I think this speaks for itself. Now, a few months later, Darkstarters 3 did receive an updated version. Sort of. You see, much like how Capcom kept putting out different versions of Street Fighter, they decided to do the same with Darkstarters 3, but only in Japan, where they simultaneously released not one, but two editions. Vampire Hunter 2 and Vampire Savior 2. You see, as I mentioned, Donovan, Huitzel, and Pyron were left out of this game, and the reason why is because if Capcom had included them, then the roster would have grown too large, and the technical limitations of the game would have become noticeable. So, they had to remove three characters, and for lore purposes, those three made the most sense. But they still wanted a way to include them. So the answer to that was essentially just to release Vampire Red and Vampire Blue editions. So, Vampire Hunter 2 brought back the three characters who had been cut, while removing the four new characters added in Darkstalkers 3, aka Vampire Savior, essentially making this just the cast of Vampire Hunter, only now with the mechanics of Vampire Savior. But in Vampire Savior 2, they kept the four characters from Vampire Savior in, as well as the three returning characters, and to balance it out, they cut Rikuo, Sasquatch, and John Talbane, leading me to ask, what does Japan have against John Talbane? He's a kung fu werewolf. How can you not love that? We should be putting him on the flag. But in addition to all these returning characters, there was one new addition to the roster. Kind of. They include a brand new secret character, Marionette, who was essentially just a mirror match mode. If you selected Marionette, then the round would start with her descending from the ceiling and then possessing an unconscious body that was a duplicate of whatever character it was that you were going up against. As I said, it's just a mirror match mode, but it's a really cool way to do a mirror match mode. The next year, Darkstalkers 3 came to home consoles around the world, going under the name Vampire Xavier EX Edition in Japan, and as you can tell from that name, this home port was indeed different. It now included all 18 characters from the series history, as well as all the secret characters. But how could that be, you ask? Weren't the characters cut because of hardware limitations? How could they fit all of these characters into the PlayStation and keep the game running so well? They didn't. Yeah, several frames of animation had to be cut to make this work, which made the home release kind of awkward and clunky compared to the much smoother arcade release. Trust me folks, I know that when it comes to fighting games you want every character to return for every single installment, but sometimes characters do need to be cut, not every game can be Smash Bros Ultimate. So there you have it. That was the final Darkstalkers release. A beloved franchise that for many years was a favorite among Capcom fans had come to an end. But, much like the monsters that inspired this series, Darkstalkers wouldn't die. Instead, it entered an uncanny state of walking undeath. No new games were coming out, but instead the series kept putting out one re-release after another, year after year after year. As I mentioned in our Capcom Fine Evolution video, it was around the end of the 90s and the beginning of the 2000s when the arcade scene, the place where fighting games lived, was starting to die, and Capcom was seeing diminishing returns on their new fighting games, with the original release of Street Fighter 3 in 1997 actually being something of a failure for them. I say this every time that we talk about that game, but yes, today Street Fighter 3, at least the third installment, is considered a classic. But when it came out, it massively underperformed for Capcom. So if that's what happened for the new release of their biggest fighting game franchise, you can bet they were nervous about putting out any other fighting game series. And no game was hurt more by this than Darkstalkers. Capcom refused to even entertain the idea of a new Darkstalkers, but in 2000, they made Vampire Chronicles for matching service. Wow. Money name right there, huh? Just rolls right off the tongue. This was a version of Darkstalkers made just for Japan for the Sega Dreamcast, and you could only get it if you special ordered it. Yeah, Capcom was so nervous about putting out a fighting game at this time, you had to special order that thing because they were only going to print however many copies they knew they could sell. But despite all the hoops you had to jump through to get this thing, it was actually a very cool version of the game. It featured every single character, and when you selected them, you could choose which game mechanics you wanted them to fight with. You could have the exact same characters face off with each other, and they would play completely differently. Night Warriors Morgan vs. Darkstalkers 3 Morgan? You could make that happen. Don't know why you'd want that, since every installment of the game made these characters stronger. Feels like if you chose one of the earlier versions, you'd be at a huge disadvantage, but hey, it's a cool idea. 
Also, the game featured an online versus mode, one of the first games for Capcom to have that. This game would actually be re-released in 2004 on the PSP in Japan, and would finally see a release in the West in 2005 under the name Darkstalkers Chronicles The Chaos Tower. Again, every single character from the previous games were present and played just like that Dreamcast version that I mentioned, but now it featured a brand new mode called The Chaos Tower. You would select three characters, start at the bottom of this tower, and using these characters, you would have to climb up 100 floors with a battle on each floor, all leading up to a fight with a Pyron that had four health bars. Not only was this a massive test of your abilities, it also introduced a level of strategy because you could actually skip floors or choose who you got to fight on the next floor if you managed to pull off special conditions in your matches. However, we are not done with the Darkstalkers re-release train just yet, oh no, because in the same year, 2005, Japan saw the release of Vampire the Darkstalker Chronicles on the PlayStation 2, which was the compilation of every single Darkstalkers game. Vampire, Vampire Hunter, Vampire Savior, Vampire Hunter 2, and Vampire Savior 2, with a brand new secret character being made available just for this re-release. D. This was Donovan as he appeared in his ending from Vampire Hunter where he lost control of the darkness inside of him. He was now a villain and had a sprite that was made up of a red Dimitri sprite with a different face and given several of Donovan's moves. And they even gave D his own special ending which carried on from where Donovan's ending left off. We now saw an older Anita returning to face off with her former friend and had to put him out of his misery. This is actually the final bit of story to be added to the Darkstalker series, and I have to admit, it's a pretty appropriate end. One of the former heroes of the series had turned evil, and now we see Anita years later having to put a stop to him. For a series that was all about monsters and battling the forces of darkness, seeing the hero lose his fight with the evil inside of him and now being killed? Yeah, that's an ending alright! Nothing says the series is over quite like that. Now, even though that's the end of the Darkstalker story, it's not the end of the story of Darkstalkers. Oh no! Things are about to get far more complicated and a lot more depressing. But before I get into that, because I know someone out there will ask me to cover it, let's talk quickly about the multimedia empire that Darkstalkers tried to build for itself. Yeah, Darkstalkers didn't stop at the border of video games, no, they stretched out into other forms of entertainment. Or at least they tried to. Over the years, there were multiple mangas featuring the Night Warriors, including one that specifically focused on Lilith's story, and another called Maleficarum that featured the Darkstalkers crossing over with another Capcom fighting franchise, Red Earth. In 2004, Udon Comics, the creators of the Street Fighter comics, started adapting the Darkstalkers characters as well over multiple miniseries with the most recent being Street Fighter vs. Darkstalkers. It was a fun crossover between these two fighting game franchises that featured some nice bits of fan service and a few deep lore dives, such as the introduction of Violent Ken. And probably the most successful bit of Darkstalkers media outside of the games was in 1997 when the creators of the Street Fighter 2 animated movie and Gundam Wing made a four-part Darkstalkers OVA, which is actually pretty good and featured some amazing animation. And that was about it. That was all the notable bits of Darkstalkers. <sighs> okay, fine. In 1995, much like Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat, Darkstalkers received its own American animated series. And just like the Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat cartoons, it was bad. In fact, it was the worst of any of the animated video game shows of the 90s. And don't even think about saying, what about Double Dragon? I've seen Double Dragon, Darkstalkers was worse. The series centered around the brand new character who was created just for the show, Harry Grimoire. He was this little kid who could use magic, and he was meant to be the audience's guide to the world of Darkstalkers, and no one liked him or asked for him to return again. And as for the actual writing on the show, I said Darkstalkers was goofy. But this show was just flat out ridiculous with how silly it was trying to be. Don't get me wrong, you can make a Darkstalkers animated series that's just meant to be a comedy and is just meant to be weird and silly and just here for fun. But if you're going to do that, you should maybe actually have some good jokes in there. Supreme Faro has awakened! All hail the Imperial Pudding! 
There are lizards in my pants! The only two things that were remotely good about this show were the running Rakuo strangely attractive for a fish man joke, which has become a meme for the community. Though you are strangely attractive for a fish man. Even though you are curiously attractive for a fish man. Oh, you're almost pretty. For a fish man. <laughs> and Scott McNeil as Lord Raptor. But he would return to play that character two years later in the OVA, so, uh, yeah, there's no reason to watch this thing. And while we're talking about the legacy and impact of Darkstalkers, we should point out that even if there weren't any new games in this series after this point, these characters did explode into several other games. Morgan, Felicia, BB Hood, and Anna Karras appeared in the Marvel vs. Capcom series. Morgan was in the Capcom vs. SNK series. Dimitri was in SVC Chaos, where he did still have his Midnight Blizz attack, so if you ever wanted to see a gender-bent Geese Howard, there you go. Morgan, Donovan, Hisinko, and Felicia appeared in the Puzzle Fighter series. BB Hood appeared in the home version of Ken and Spike. And multiple characters, including Morgan, Felicia, Dimitri, and Jetta, even appeared as playable characters and bosses in the NIS game Cross Edge, where many of these characters received their first, and in some cases, only English voices in a video game. And that is all that I know about Cross Edge. Despite the fact that I own it. Seriously, what is this and why do I have it? So, despite the fact that it had now been over a decade since a new Darkstalkers game was made, these characters were still popular and people wanted to see them come back. There was definitely a demand for another Darkstalkers. But sadly, not everyone saw that. And that brings us to the stake that would be plunged deep into the heart of this series. As we mentioned in our last episode, the fighting game scene was dying down, and with the release of Capcom Fine Evolution, that coffin was slammed shut and a truck full of dirt was dumped on top of it. Capcom was done with fighting games. But there was an outcry to bring the genre back. Not just from fans, but from within Capcom itself. Yoshinori Ono kept championing for Street Fighter to return, and finally Capcom decided to give him a shot. They released Street Fighter 4 in arcades in 2008 and on home consoles in early 2009, and that game exploded. It was a massive success for Capcom and for fighting games in general. It ushered in a new boom for fighting games as old franchises were returning, new series were being born, the age of online play was now upon us. It was a new day for fighting games, and when asked about what other fighting game he'd like to see come back, Yoshinori Ono was always outspoken that he wanted Darkstalkers to return. But he said that Keiji Inafune, the head of Capcom Research and Development, wouldn't let that happen, saying that Inafune would need one million requests before he agreed to bring Darkstalkers back. Now, okay, some of you, when you hear of Keiji Inafune, think, oh, that's the guy who led development on Mega Man for some of his best games and helped to build up Capcom. And some of you, when you hear of Keiji Inafune, think, oh, that's the guy who almost killed Capcom. Yes, in the later half of the 90s, Inafune started moving up the corporate ladder over at Capcom. And at first, this led to some great new Mega Man games and the Onimusha franchise. But starting in the early 2000s, Inafune looked at the changing video game landscape and said, you know what? Games are selling more in the West than in Japan, which, okay, that was true. But rather than saying our games are selling well in the West, clearly the West likes what we're making. No, instead he said, if we want to sell more games, we need to make our games specifically to appeal to the West. And good thing I, Keiji Inafune, know what people in the West like. Over the years, Keiji kept gaining more power and kept pushing everyone else at Capcom to make games specifically aimed at what he thought the West wanted. And sure, sometimes it did lead to a success like Dead Rising. And... Um... Lost Planet? I guess? I... I think that sold okay. It, it, got, a, it got a couple games. That... That counts, right? But for every one of those successes, there was another one of these. And this. And that. That too. Oh, oh and then of course there was this. 
And of course, who can forget the final game that he approved before he left Capcom? Fuck you! Fuck you! Fuck you! Yeah, and at this time, Inafune still wasn't that big on bringing back older franchises. And when asked about Ono's comments on how he wouldn't let him bring back Darkstalkers, Inafune said, and I quote, We're asked this question quite a bit. Ono-san understands lots of people are waiting for Darkstalkers. However, the difficulty about fighting games is we had a boom and it went away. So most of the developers went out of the business or moved on to some other types of games. Apparently, creating a fighting game is not so easy. You really need the talent and skill and balancing ability to sort the game out. So, at the moment, there aren't the resources to create another fighting game. However, I recommend you ask the same question again and again and again whenever you meet Ono-san. Okay, for starters, Inafune makes some good points here. Fighting games are a difficult type of game that not everybody can pull off. Just because you can make one type of game doesn't mean you know how to make a fighting game. And yes, back in the early 2000s, the fighting game industry did try up, especially in Japan. So there were fewer studios to choose from. Here's where the argument starts breaking down a bit, though. He made this statement in 2010 when the fighting game industry was roaring back. New studios were making new games left and right at the time. There was indeed a new fighting game boom happening, and it's a boom his own company created. Heck, it's a boom his own company created, and he was taking advantage of. Street Fighter 4 wasn't the only new installment of a classic Capcom fighter being made at this time. Literally, as Inafune was making these comments, Capcom was promoting the new Marvel vs. Capcom game that would come out the very next year. It's enough to make me wonder if maybe Inafune just had it out for Darkstalkers. I mean, as I said, he did believe that all their games should appeal to the West, and unlike Street Fighter and Marvel, Darkstalkers always saw its best sales in Japan. Also, that statement there at the end about asking Ono over and over and over again about this, it almost sounds like it's got some spite in there. Like he's trying to tell the people at home to just bother Ono until they break his spirit. It's like he is just flat out saying, I want nothing to do with this conversation. He tells the reporter and everyone at home to stop asking him, Keiji Inafune, about a new Darkstalkers, and instead ask Yoshinori Ono, the guy who said he can't make a new Darkstalkers because Keiji Inafune won't let him. That's like when the regional manager of a retail store tells you, oh, you have a problem with the store? Uh, well then... Complain to that cashier over there. The cashier can't do anything about this problem. They're as fed up with it as you are. However, as dark as things looked on the horizon, there was hope. Because in October of 2010, just a few months after giving that interview, Keiji Inafune left Capcom. And while he had lit many fuses that wouldn't ignite for years to come, there was definitely a change at Capcom almost immediately being seen. The new heads at Capcom actually supported their fighting games. They actually saw the success that the genre was having, and they realized they should be jumping at it. Suddenly, Capcom was pushing fighting games more. They were even re-releasing some older games with crisp new graphics. And so, the next year, in 2011, Udon Comics, who I remind you worked on Capcom's comics so they did have connections from within the company itself, reported that they reached out to Capcom because they had heard from a reliable source that Capcom was working on a new Darkstalkers game, and they wanted in on it. They were rejected, but this did get the rumor mills a-turning, and those turns went into overdrive a few months later when at a Comic-Con panel, Yoshinori Ono declared to the world, Darkstalkers are not dead, and then photographed the audience holding up money to tell Capcom it was time. He knew the new heads of Capcom would listen, and that the audience was here for it. There was hope again. It looked like after a long, hard battle, the Darkstalkers had finally won and they would get to rise again. The nightmare was finally over. At least, that's what we'd like to think. But you see, dear viewer, the tale of Darkstalkers 
has always been a horror story. And you know there can't be a happy ending in a horror story. Oh, no, no, no. No, like in any good horror movie, just when you think it's over, just when you think you're safe, that's when the killer rises up one last time. Yes, Street Fighter Cross Tekken. Now, I do not have time to go into the full history of this game, and there are many other people online who have already covered it in detail. But you know how I said Capcom's new heads were supporting their fighting games? Yeah, maybe they were supporting them a bit too much. Development on this game started in 2010, but the ad campaign for it started rolling out the next year in 2011. And Capcom dumped so much money into this game. Just buckets of cash being thrown at this thing whenever they possibly could, from multiple extensive cinematic trailers to using actually licensed songs rather than in-house composed scores, to the massive roster that was bigger than anything Capcom had ever done without reusing sprites, to telling Bandai Namco that they'd make money off this project as well, so much money was spent on this game because Capcom thought that it was going to bring in the combined sales of the last Street Fighter and the last Tekken game combined. Not stopping to think about the fact that, uh, I don't know, maybe there was an overlap in there? Or maybe some of the people who were new to fighting games and started on either of those two games wouldn't feel all that comfortable jumping into a crossover game if they didn't know who half the roster was. Yeah, those thoughts never crossed their minds because they were too busy thinking about what name they were going to give the boat they were going to buy after this game brought in all the money. But you know what? Even if this game wasn't going to hit the insanely high expectations they set for themselves, it was still going to sell well. It totally was going to make its budget back. I mean, it's the biggest 2D fighter in the world going up against the biggest 3D fighter in the world for the very first time at the height of a brand new fighting game boom. This was massive. The only way this was going to flop would be if Capcom royally borked things up. And bork they did. Between the confusing gym system that was obviously a pay to win mechanic that everyone hated, to the Pandora system that killed your own character and made you lose the match in six seconds, which everyone hated, and then of course, the on-disc DLC that leaked before the game was even released and ooh, you better believe everyone hated that. All of this and more accumulated to make the game massively undersell. So, what does this have to do with Darkstalkers you might ask? Well, one year after Yoshinori Ono announced to the world that Darkstalkers are not dead, and a few months after Street Fighter Cross Tekken, Ono went to New York Comic Con where he showed off a new big spectacular trailer for a brand new Darkstalkers game. The crowd was hyped. They were on their feet with excitement. They were thrusting out wads of cash and telling Capcom to shut up and take their money, only to have their hopes immediately dashed when they learned that this wasn't a new game but yet another re-release. Yes, Darkstalkers Resurrection was announced for the PS3 and Xbox 360, much to the dismay of pretty much everyone. I remember when this announcement was made, I was personally so flabbergasted by it, I didn't even believe it was happening. I'm not kidding you, I actually thought this was a brand new Darkstalkers and they were just showing off old footage because they didn't have anything new ready to show yet. Or maybe it was just going to use the old sprites for some reason, and they were only showing off the old characters, but any day now they were going to show off some brand new characters, right? Oh. Oh, so, so none of those things are happening. This really is just a re-release. Oh. Well, I'm sure they're putting out a re-release right now, so that way everyone will get hyped up for when the brand new game is announced, right? I am not proud of admitting how long I stayed in denial about this. This puzzled me so much. Why, when fighting games were doing so well, wouldn't they just make a brand new Darkstalkers? And much more perplexingly, why would you make a big huge cinematic trailer for a simple re-release? and then not put that trailer anywhere. Yeah, seriously, that cinematic trailer 
has never been put up on Capcom's YouTube channel, and it wasn't even available in the gallery mode of the re-release that it claimed to be promoting. I will admit, I am 100% speculating on this. I am simply looking at the information available to us and making my best judgment, but it really feels like a brand new Darkstalkers was indeed in the works. This was the big trailer that they originally made to promote it. But then after Street Fighter Cross Tekken underperformed just a few months before this, Capcom said, whoa, hold up. It's possible to lose money on a fighting game? That's not what we signed up for. Yeah, okay. We haven't yet gotten too far into the development of that new Darkstalkers. All we really have is the announcement trailer. Tell you what, let's get Iron Galaxy, the guys who did that Street Fighter Third Strike re-release we did a couple months ago, and have them do one for Darkstalkers. And if that sells well, then maybe, maybe we'll make a new game. So yes, Iron Galaxy put out Darkstalkers Resurrection in 2013, which collected together arcade ports of the second and third games, cleaned up the sprites, and included features like online play and in-game achievements, and... yeah, that was it. Don't get me wrong, the sprites did look great, and the online did actually function pretty well, at least compared to other games at the time. But considering that previous Darkstalkers re-releases include things like brand new modes and completely new characters with brand new bits of story behind them, yeah, this collection was kind of bare bones. And this was the game that had to sell in order for Capcom to approve a brand new game. And sadly, it couldn't do that. The game failed to gain any real attention and couldn't sell any actual solid numbers. Oh wait, I'm wrong, it totally did. Yeah, many times when people talk about this game, they always say, oh, the game didn't sell, so Capcom canceled a new Darkstalkers. And it's understandable why people would think that, since the sales numbers aren't available, so people can only go on what Capcom tells them. Well, guess what? I actually did some digging on this, and I found that in March 2013, the month that this game came out, it was the 7th highest selling game on the PlayStation Network. How good is 7th place? Number 6 was Bioshock Infinite, and number 5 was the Tomb Raider reboot, which sold a million copies in 24 hours. Yeah, don't just believe everything that Capcom tells you on this one, people. This game sold. It just didn't sell what Capcom wanted it to. Because apparently, Capcom thought this game would sell as much as a brand new game. Well, if that's what you wanted, maybe you should have made a brand new game! This is another reason why I do think there was a brand new game in development. Because these sales numbers on a bare bones re-release of two games that were over 15 years old? That's huge! Those are indeed impressive numbers! Unless you needed this thing to also cover the cost of something else. Like, say, some pre-production work on a game that you had to scrap. Also, remember how I said two years ago Udon had heard from within Capcom that they were working on some new Darkstalkers project? Well, Iron Galaxy did put work in this re-release, but not two years worth of work. This clearly wasn't what Udon had heard about. And heck, earlier this very year, Yoshinori Ono, now no longer at Capcom, finally broke his silence on the subject and said that when he made that big Darkstalkers Are Not Dead announcement, that wasn't for the re-release. No, he really was trying to get a new game made at that point. Again, this is all just speculation, this is all just working off the little bits of information that we have available to us, but I truly do believe that when he originally showed off that trailer the next year at Comic-Con, it was originally made for a completely different, unreleased game. And there was probably even more work done behind the scenes that we never even got to see. And let me just go ahead and say, I've been pretty vocal over the years with how hot and cold I am on Yoshinori Ono's time on Capcom's fighting games. He didn't always make the best choices. But I will say, I respect the hell out of the guy for fighting so hard to try and bring this franchise back when literally everyone in the company was telling him no. But yes, Darkstalkers Resurrection did not sell as much as Capcom wanted, and... Listen folks, we're at the end of the show. There's no more Darkstalkers news after this. So I hope you'll all forgive me, but I want to end the show today by actually addressing why Darkstalkers Resurrection didn't sell as much as Capcom wanted it to, because this is something I have been sitting on for eight years now thinking about all the preposterous decisions that went into this re-release. And just to clarify, 
This is all aimed at the people making decisions at Capcom. None of it is aimed at anyone who worked at Iron Galaxy on the remake because they did exactly what they were told to do and put out a project that even if it is lacking some modes or characters or cool extras, it is still a solid reproduction of those original games. But to imagine that this game would ever, ever sell like a brand new installment was nothing short of madness. First up, fighting games are bought up by two main audiences. Hardcore fighting game fans and casual fans. And first off, let me just clarify, I know some people look over at the casual fans as being lesser or being not as important and that is a load of crap. Casual fans are important to the fighting game scene. They're important to all video game communities. We here love casual fighting game fans. You guys keep this genre alive. You're the reason fighting games have good single player content and big crazy cinematic supers. And you know something? Casual fighting game fans make up way more cells than the hardcore fans. I'd say casual fans make up about 75 to 80% of all the people playing fighting games. And if you think I'm exaggerating that number, I'm actually probably lowballing it. You want a good indication of the divide between casual and dedicated fighting game fans? Do a little experiment. Go to your PlayStation trophy list, find a fighting game, now find the easiest trophy that you can get through online matches. Then see how many people have gotten that trophy. There's your answer. For example, at the time of this recording, Street Fighter V, Capcom's only fighting game on the market right now, has a trophy for winning one ranked match. That's it, just one single ranked match. And it has a completion rate of 9.5%. Over 90% of the people who bought that game had zero interest in going online. And remember, when that game launched, it only had online. Now, why do I bring this up in relationship to Darkstalkers Resurrection? Because as I have just pointed out, if you want your fighting game to succeed, you need to bring in both casual and dedicated fighting game fans. And I've got news for you. Casual fighting game fans don't care about re-releases of 15-year-old games. They want new games. All those people in the past two years before this game's re-release who got into fighting games through Street Fighter 4 and Marvel vs. Capcom 3 did not look over at this and say, oh yeah, that's that good <laughs> So right off the bat, you have put out a game that was really only aimed at maybe 20 to 25% of your target audience. And I got news for you, that 20 to 25% didn't want this game either. They had been dragged around for years at this point, being tempted with the idea of a brand new Darkstalkers game only to get not the first, not the second, not the third, but the fourth re-release of these exact same games. Well, okay, that's not entirely fair. I mean, at least this was the first time that you could buy these games on this console generation. Oh wait, I forgot, you also re-released these games as part of the PS1 Classics Collection a year earlier. This was the fifth time you re-released these games, and the second time on this exact same console generation. So not only was that remaining 20 to 25% of your audience upset that they weren't getting a new game, you were now telling them to buy the thing that they more than likely already owned. If you buy this re-release, then we'll make a new Darkstalkers. But we bought it already. I had to get a PSP to play it, but I did it. It's done. Yes, but now you have to buy it on different consoles. Again and again. And again and again and again. If you want to know how disappointed this audience was with this re-release and how much they were not asking for this, again, let's use the old trophy test. The big selling point that made this game different was that now you can play online even though previous versions also had an online feature, but this was better online, you were meant to spend time on it. And the trophy for completing 10 online matches has a 4% completion rate. So 96% of the diehard Darkstalkers fans picked up this game, looked at the hot selling point of it, and said, what? No, I don't care about that. I'm only buying this, so hopefully you'll make a new one. I am so, so tired 
And with all of that, with all the stumblings I just mentioned, with all the disappointment that this game had behind it, it was still the seventh best selling game in the month of its release, sitting right behind the long awaited sequel to the smash hit Bioshock and the best selling Tomb Raider game of all time. Now, normally, this is the part of the show where I tell you that there's still hope, that things are suddenly turning around, but yeah, I got nothing for you folks. There is nothing on the horizon for Darkstalkers. These characters are forever forced to wander the earth like cursed spirits roaming from one guest appearance or mobile game to another with no game to call their own. And even if there was a new game on the way, I got a really sneaking suspicion that it would be another re-release. It would be another game Capcom would put out as a test to see if people were willing to support the franchise. And in case anyone at Capcom is listening to this, in case they're thinking, hey, maybe we should put out the sixth re-release to test if people want a new game now, I am begging you, don't. Just make a new game. You do not need to put out a re-release to test the waters. That's not a good test. If you really want to test if people want a new Darkstalkers, I'll save you a lot of time and money. Go on Twitter and just type in Morgan and see how many hits you get. The last game came out almost 25 years ago, and to this day, people are still flooding the internet with art, craft, cosplay, and more of these characters. People who weren't even born when the last game was made still love these characters because it is as true today as it was in 1994 when the game was first released. Monsters fighting each other is just cool. It's fun, and people want it. And Capcom, if I still haven't sold you on this, if ever this entire video, you still don't think a Darkstalkers 4 would sell, well, need I remind you that you spent the last year hyping up a new Resident Evil based solely around the premise that had a sexy monster lady in it? Gee, if only you had an entire franchise where that was half the cast. Don't look at me like that, audience. I'm desperate here. If that's what it takes to get Capcom to listen to reason, I will do it. Well, that was a depressing thought to leave us off on, but I will say that even if Darkstalkers are gone forever, the mechanics they introduce, the ideas of a fighter built around fast-paced aggressive gameplay, that DNA went on to build an entire genre of fighting games. It's because of this game that we got things like Guilty Gear and Blaze Blue and Melty Blood, so even if the series has drawn its final breath, its legacy and the impact it made will never truly die. Again, I'm really just trying to end on a positive note here, folks. It's rough out there. Well, tell you what, let's ignore Capcom and their foolishness tonight because it's Halloween. Let's all celebrate tonight. Get yourself some candy, put on a good cheesy horror movie, or heck, boot up your own copy of Darkstalkers. I'm sure you got one laying around. There's tons of them to choose from. And try to enjoy yourself tonight. Thank you all for joining me today on another fighting game retrospective, and thank you for joining me all month long as we celebrate spooky games. If you want to see our whole playlist of Thorgy Ween videos, it'll be popping up right there. And if you like these videos, then please leave a comment, give us a thumbs up, subscribe, do all that other stuff that you gotta do here on YouTube, and also share this video around the web. You have no idea how many views we get, how many subscribers we get, just from you guys spreading these videos around the web. I really do appreciate it. And you can always keep up to date with me and what we've got planned next for the channel by following me on Twitter at Thorgy's Arcade. One more time, thank you all for tuning in, stay safe out there, and happy Halloween.